Welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to embrace your God-given gifts, skills, and passions in order to lead with confidence. We want you to remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, and you are fully loved by Him. You have been designed on purpose by God with unique gifts and passions in order to love and lead those around you. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield. And I'm Esther's co-host, Holly Kane. Together, we chat about important issues that Christian women leaders face. In addition, we interview other women just like you who lead in various roles from church to community to business. Through this podcast, we offer you encouragement, tools, and resources to help you on your leadership journey. We are so glad you're here with us. Hi, friend, and welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. Today, we're sharing an episode from the early days of the podcast. It's a deep cut that you may have missed, especially if you've started listening more recently. But even if you've heard it when it was released, you're sure to benefit from this Leadership Rewind episode. We're sharing these Leadership Rewind episodes because we have found that some of our older episodes haven't reached as many women as our newer ones, yet they're packed with full of value and amazing guidance for you as a leader. So we want to encourage you to listen to this episode and then perhaps check out some of the other episodes that are linked in the show notes. One quick note, you may hear us or our guest mention resources in this conversation. And since it's from several years ago, some of those resources may not be available at this time. We hope you enjoy this Leadership Rewind. And if you find it valuable, please share it with a friend. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the podcast. I am excited to have Carrie Sharp with me today. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Esther. So glad to have you on. And I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself with everybody. Well, I am a communication consultant and speaker. I live in northern Michigan. So it's God's country up here. Sorry to anyone who doesn't live here. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty similar to Maine. (laughs) It is. Yes, it is. But we have the Great Lakes. So Mm, that's true. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I've been married to my husband, Ryan, for almost 21 years. And we have five kids who I homeschool. And I should say that I homeschool four of those now because we just graduated our oldest. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. I do feel like that was a huge accomplishment, not just for her, but for me. (laughs) Yeah, I would say so. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. And you guys have a business, right? We do. It's called He Says, She Says. It's all communication based. So whether it is helping someone speak on stage or prepare for a podcast interview, or my husband does a lot with sales, helping people build relationships for sales, we're your people. If it's about talking and listening, we're there. Yes, yes. And that is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast today because of your expertise in communication and how important that is in leadership. So I know we're going to talk about that some. So before we get into that, though, let's talk a little bit about just your experience as a leader. Can you tell us about your leadership journey and what has brought you to where you are today? I just feel like I've been a leader since birth. I'm a very type A driven person. And so any chance that I've ever had to take charge and take the lead, I have. It just (laughs) comes natural. You know, when I was little, they called it bossy. (laughs) Yes. I have heard that more than once recently. (laughs) (laughs) And so I've done a lot of leadership. I've been in charge of a lot of things. I've been the president of a lot of groups or my husband and I have both led different you know, organizations or whatever. So I feel like that's just been a natural part of who I am. But I also feel like I've learned a lot along the way because you can't stay bossy and be a good leader. It doesn't really (laughs) mesh. No, it doesn't work out so good. (laughs) People don't like to be led by bossiness. (laughs) So I've had to read a lot of books and learn a lot of different skills along the way, people skills primarily and communication skills. Right. So I think... When it really came to the forefront was when our third child was born, and that is our son, Maverick. Mm -hmm. Maverick almost died at birth from a rare bacterial infection, and he spent several weeks in the NICU. And so we were away from our two other children, and we had to work together as a team, Ryan and I did, and we had to communicate with each other and with my parents at home who were taking care of our kids and with all of the medical staff and professionals. And 
we just learned through that that you have to be able to speak effectively and listen effectively and lead. I mean, here we were advocates for this tiny person who can't speak for himself, and we had to learn to lead through that. Right. So leading our family has been just as important as leading in all other aspects of our life. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And it's it's so important to see your family and the people that are in your direct influence as your first, the first line of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the, uh, the lessons that you've learned in terms of, you mentioned like all of these different experiences that you've had and leading different things. Are there any particular lessons that have come out for you from that experience or from other leadership experiences that you've had? Aside from the fact that I can't be bossy all the time, <laughs> I've learned that I need to not judge other people. You can't lead those people you are condemning. And so I've had to become a very good listener and learn to find out why people are believing the way that they are and why they're thinking the way they are and why they're tending to do the things that they're doing. And once you really take the time to listen and understand other people, it's a lot easier to lead them and love them, honestly. Yeah. And it, it's, been, it's been a lot of learning on my part because I think the tendency is to just judge. You know, yeah. they don't do something the same way I do or they don't think the same way I think. And it's easy to judge in those yes. situations. Yeah. And, and really what you're talking about is the fact that we are all wired so differently, right? Mm -hmm. We're all, we all have these unique gifts that we bring to the table. And sometimes those gifts can, you know, they can be so different that we don't always get along with people we're leading alongside or people that we are leading. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know what are some of the things that you have done or any particular tools or resources that you have found to understand yourself better so that you can be a more effective leader? Well, first of all, I studied political science and psychology in college. <laughs> and <laughs> a lot of it I learned there. Yeah. Because people's circumstances and situations and backgrounds are key in addition to their natural gifts. And you have to understand those things before you can learn why they tick the way they tick yeah. and, and where they're coming from. Yeah. But I also really like this book called Personality Plus. It's by Florence Litauer. That book I, is the one that really revolutionized my marriage. It helped me understand my husband, Ryan. It helped me understand all my children. It helps us relate better and kind of play on each other's strengths, but also fill in each other's weaknesses. Right. And that's also very important to us. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So in terms of your own gifts and strengths, what are some of those? <laughs> It'd be a lot easier to tell you the weaknesses. <laughs> like the Why do we always struggle to talk about our strengths? Uh, right. right? <laughs> well, I think my my main strength has just always been communicating. I just always have been a good communicator. Mm. And I strive to do better all the time. I think that's a strength. Yeah. So I've used those in combination with each other to to reach where I'm at now. Um, communicating is important to me and it's always been something I've naturally been good at because I can kind of see where the loopholes are in what people are saying. That my children do not appreciate this gift, but I, it's good for me. <laughs> yes. What a great skill to have as a parent. <laughs> I can kind of understand where people are leaving things out and maybe why and, and seeing deep down into why they're saying what they're saying and understanding really where they're coming from so right. that we can draw those things out and, and do better with those. Right, right. So communication and dealing with conflict are something that all leaders encounter, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's when you're leading your own kids at home yep. <laughs> or whether you are leading a, a business or if you're leading in a church situation, mm -hmm. um, there's always conflict because people are imperfect and there's mm -hmm. not you know, there's not a way to go around that. So can you share any recommendations that you would have for a leader who wants to communicate more effectively? Yeah, conflict is inevitable. 
it just will always be there. It shows up at the daily breakfast table, right? What yeah. cereal are we eating for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Conflict number one of the day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it will always be there. The, the point is to learn to manage it effectively and not burn bridges while doing so. Mm. Yeah. First things first, you have to learn what conflict needs to be addressed and what conflict needs to be overlooked. Some mm-hmm. things we just need to dish out the grace and move on. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Other things we need to ask ourselves, is this the hill I'm willing to die on? Is this battle important enough for me to get involved? And if it is, first we need to pray through it. I, it's a number one, pray through it. God, show me if this is the conflict I need to deal with. Give me the words to speak when I need right. to speak them. Yeah. And then if we're sure we need to deal with it, and if we've gotten that guidance from God, then we need to go ahead and deal with it. And the very first thing I would say is deal with the person directly. I mean, that it's told to us in the Bible, but so many times we're tempted to talk to everyone and their brother besides the person we should be talking to, yes. or we put cryptic little messages on Facebook so that people kind of know we're third partying this, this person. And those are no, no's don't ever do that, but speak yeah. directly to the person mm. and just go in with the heart to understand where they're coming from. Seek to understand first and then deal with the things that are said to you. Right. Yeah. Those are such good points. And I think especially the point about talking directly to the person, it's Mm -hmm. amazing to me how much, even in Christian circles, that that does not happen. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really detrimental to Mm -hmm. to us as as believers if we are supposed to be keeping a unity of the faith, right? (laughs) Right. And yet we are not following that, that principle of going to one another first. Right. Sometimes you'll see it hidden away as a prayer request. Yes. <laughs> oh, let's pray for sister so-and-so. She is really ticking me off. <laughs> Let me tell you all the things she's done. <laughs> yes. Yes. So do you have any, any tips for the person who maybe knows that they need to go to someone? They, they have a conflict. And I know you shared with us some things to do, but specifically about wording or about ways to phrase things that would make the, the, you know, the communication or the conversation flow more smoothly, especially for someone that maybe is just feeling like they're just super nervous about this, you know, this conflict resolution process. Yes. And we always are because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. We don't want to do this wrong. We don't want to sin in some way. Mm -hmm. I go into it trying to ask a lot of questions rather than make statements. Statements tend to show more judgment and questions tend to help you understand the situation better. So many times I have gone into a situation thinking I know the other person's motives and why the conflict happened in the first place. And when I start asking questions, I find out I was dead wrong. And if I had gone in there, guns a blazing, I would have been so, so sorry that I had. And so it's very important that we go in asking questions rather than making statements And, you know, even when you have to make statements, you can word them in such a way that we're not putting the other person on the defensive. If you say, you did blah, 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 and you, and you, and you, if you start your sentence with you, that is going to make the other person so defensive. If you say, I feel like, or I felt like this when this happened, and then ask a question, you know, how come that happened? What can we do to make this better? It's a lot easier. Yeah, and, and work together as a team to reach a, a resolution, right? We're right. in this as a team. And yeah. so we need to try to work together to resolve the conflict in a way that's acceptable to both parties. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. Those are unfortunate circumstances. But right. most of the time, if we go in with an open heart and non-judgmental and really seeking to understand the other person's side of things, we can resolve the conflict. Yes. And as a leader, whether you are a business owner and maybe you're working with other team members or you're a ministry leader and you're working with volunteers, I know I've been in the situation where someone has come and brought something to me and started with those statements Mm -hmm. and just started right off being upset about something I didn't do. And that feels so icky as the person (laughs) receiving that. (laughs) But on the flip side, receiving someone coming and saying, hey, I I just had a question about how this went. And could I ask you a few questions about the situation? Mm -hmm. That changes the situation. So as a leader, 
that is so important to to go in with the questions first and not yes. assuming that you know. <laughs> right. And the timing is important too, don't you think? Mm-hmm. If you're catching someone in the middle of a stressful situation, that's not the best time to try to resolve a conflict. <laughs> right. No. Sometimes just waiting a day, sleeping on it, you know, getting some perspective maybe from your spouse or somebody that's not going to pass it along as gossip. Yep. Those kinds of things are so important. The timing is key. Timing is everything they say, mm-hmm. and it's true. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> and that works for whether you are approaching your spouse or mm-hmm. a coworker or you know someone you lead. It doesn't matter. It's, it's good to be aware of their, the right timing for them. And also to keep in mind their um, their personality. And we talked about that book that you mentioned, mm-hmm. which I'm going to have to check out. Uh, but regardless of if you are familiar with any of the personality frameworks, the idea is that it's not just so that you can be like, well, this is how I am and this is my personality, so deal with it. It's so that you can know how you can better interact with other people. Yes. <laughs> and that yes. goes for working with your team as well. For sure. Yeah. When I read that book, I realized my husband is very, very detail oriented. He needs to know every piece of data before we can decide anything or before we can talk things through. I am not that way. I tend to fly by the seat of my pants a little bit more and go on gut instinct and follow my heart and those kinds of things. There's no right or wrong. But when I need to talk to him, I know I need to have some facts. I need to have some data to back up what I'm about to talk to him over. So yes, it's important to know these things. Right. Yeah. That's so good. So when we think about, you know, having someone else to bounce ideas off of or mm-hmm. um, go to when we feel like, okay, I don't know how to handle this situation. You know, a lot of times having a mentor is a great way to do that. So have there been any mentors in your life that have helped you to grow in your leadership? And can you tell us a little bit about them? Absolutely. Obviously, for everyone, first and foremost, it needs to be God. You need to be bringing everything there. So that goes without saying. Now, aside from that, I love to have people that I trust to talk to. And the first thing I look for in a mentor is fruit on the tree. Do you have the results that I want? I'm not going to someone with a screwed up marriage for marriage advice. Yeah. I'm not going to someone who has no children for parenting advice. I'm going to someone with fruit on the tree, right? We don't go to a bankrupt person for financial (laughs) advice. (laughs) We go to someone who has the results that we want. For me, very early on, before Ryan and I were even engaged, we were friends with the man who was his hockey coach and his wife. And they were such great examples to me of what a Christian godly marriage should look like. Mm. And so for me, the wife, Lori, was someone I looked to very early on, all the way through while we were engaged and while we were early married. How would she handle this? Or, or what would she say here? Or what things are important in marriage to her? And that was really important for me to have that role model. And as we moved on in our lives, there have been other mentors who have come in. My husband was discipled by a man named Clyde when, when we were married, probably two or three years. And that was one-on-one discipleship for every week for, mm. for, for I don't know, gosh, two, three years. Right. And that was so important to both him and to me because we learned so much about our faith so early in our marriage. And I think that set up such a great foundation for where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you've had that for your marriage and individually, you know, Mm -hmm. having those people that you can go to is invaluable. And it also helps us to not get um, too full of ourselves. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Because we we can. (laughs) Yeah, right. Well, when you're a driven person like yourself Mm -hmm. and like many of our listeners, you know, you you are a go-getter, you get stuff done, you manage multiple responsibilities. Sometimes we can start to think, well, I've got this figured out, you know? Yes. And so yes. to have that person who will kind of come back and be like, well, okay, here's, here's where maybe we need to work a little bit more on something. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's called humility. And that's yes. something I've had to learn a lot <laughs> yes. over the years because I tend to steamroll over people, mm-hmm. or at least I did earlier before yeah. I've read all these hundreds of books. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but that's my tendency. I yeah. can steamroll over anybody so yeah. easily. I have to be really, really cognizant of that. Yeah. Right. It's a valuable thing to learn for sure. 
<laughs> so a lot of us, we, I mentioned this just a minute ago, but you have, you know, multiple responsibilities. You're doing mm-hmm. a lot of different things. You're homeschooling, you've got five kids, you're running a business. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of manage juggling all those responsibilities? It's different now than it was years ago. I have learned so much. I've learned I have to say no to a whole lot of things in order to say yes to the things that are most important at this stage in my life. So I'm not nearly as active in outside groups and organizations as I used to be. Right. It's by necessity, Esther. I I would go crazy. I would lose my ever loving mind (laughs) and our whole life would suffer because of it. Yeah. So we've had to get good at making decisions about what we're going to be involved in. That I think is, is number one there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And saying no to things when you are someone who likes to get stuff done can be hard, right? It really can. It It really, really can. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, other than that, it's time management and Mm -hmm. I've had to learn that skill because it doesn't come naturally to me. I've had to read a lot of books and had a lot of help on that, Yeah, but there's no way I could survive otherwise. You cannot manage working from home and homeschooling kids and taking care of a family and a household and a husband Mm -hmm. and all the things that we do as moms and wives and women uh, without good time management. Right, right. So would you be willing to share just kind of an example, a typical day in the life of sure. Carrie? Because I think a lot of other, t- a lot of women like to know how, like literally how you do mm-hmm. it, <laughs> even yes. though it's not, it's not a formula. It's not the same for everybody, but I'd love to hear what, what your mm-hmm. day looks like. So the perfect day, and I'm just going to say yeah. that because clearly not every day goes according to plan. Right. And there are days that we're doing other things, but a perfect day would start at five in the morning and I would do work until eight or nine. Mm -hmm. And then at that point we would start schoolwork and we would do schoolwork, or at least I'd be available to the kids as they need help with schoolwork until noon. And then we would have lunch. And then in the afternoon, I do my work and take my appointments that require me to be in front of the computer uh, yeah. uninterrupted, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> until dinner time. And during those hours, our kids can be doing things that don't require me. They can be doing their reading. They can be doing workbooks. They can be doing all of that stuff. And we have a right. couple of kids now who have jobs and who drive. And so that's more in the afternoon. And then yeah. of course, dinner. And then in the evening, we do family things, or maybe I'll get another hour or two of work, depending on what's going on. Mm. Okay. Awesome. We- weekends it. primarily off. Right. Primarily. Okay. <laughs> yes. But workaholics still try to squeeze a little in, don't we? Right. right. Are there any boundaries or routines that you have in place to manage that, to help yourself, you know, not go overboard on the work? Or do you kind of just go with the flow and what feels right at the moment? Kind of both. I mean, we, we try to follow that daily schedule. So that helps with yep. the structure of things. Right. But things get interrupted or plans change or the kids suddenly need a ride somewhere and it's in the middle of when I'm supposed to be doing something. We have to work those things out. But I I really like the structure. Uh, in fact, right now it's summer and there's not as much structure and I'm I'm starting to crave yeah. <laughs> the yeah. structure. I really, I, I wish we had a little bit more right now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, so you do take the summer off from from the homeschooling stuff because mm-hmm. I know some yes. people see it like year round and that's God seemed... bless those people. Oh, I yes. am not one. My my brain shuts down at the end of May and that is just the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so I know a lot of times we as leaders have a message that we want to share with the world. Mm-hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about a message, if you have a message that you feel is yours to share with the world and kind of how you go about doing that? Yeah, there's a lot of those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it usually depends on what I'm working on with clients at the time. Right now I'm finding a lot of, I'm finding myself saying a lot that motivation is an inside job Mm. and it requires constant input because it ends tomorrow, right? Like it's short lived. I'm motivated today. I will not be motivated tomorrow. And so I have to look to self-discipline. And this is something I've been talking about with clients a lot. Mm -hmm. It's the self-discipline to get what needs to be done, done, 
regardless of whether you feel like it. Yeah. And that is what sustains us in our family life, in our business life, in work away from home, in church, whatever it is that we're doing, we yeah. have to have the self-discipline to get stuff done, whether we feel like it or not. Yeah. And so that just seems to be a thread lately, a common theme that I've been talking about a lot with mm-hmm. clients and with our kids <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and all over the place. Yeah. And it's the, the idea of discipline so often is looked at as a negative thing right? Mm -hmm. In our culture, we want to have everything right now and we want all the Mm -hmm. results, but we don't always want to put in the discipline and the effort to get there. Right. And And someone, someone said once, you will be disciplined. Wouldn't it be easier to just do it yourself? (laughs) (laughs) And I find that's true (laughs) Yeah. because if I don't put in the self-discipline and if I don't get the things done that need to get done, there are consequences. So the discipline will come. (laughs) I would just prefer to do it myself. Yes. Yes. And it's those small daily habits, those Mm -hmm. small daily actions that will get us to those bigger goals that we, that we want to achieve. Right. For sure. For sure. And that's just an ongoing process. I will never have this perfect. I I feel like I just never will. I'll have one day where I feel like, oh my gosh, I was so productive today and I was so self-disciplined and everything just went according to, you know, my plan and the way that it should all happen. (laughs) And then the next day is just a huge disaster. And I think, oh goodness, I wish every day was like that one day, you know? So it's always just learning what would be a better way of doing things or, or what would be more strategic or smarter for you know, for this thing that I'm working on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I feel the same way. I, I love structure and routine, but Mm -hmm. I'm not great at developing habits. So that's one of the things that I'm focusing on right now is just like, okay, what are these small things that I need to do Mm -hmm. and not trying to do seven of them, seven new habits in one week. (laughs) Like that's not going to work. Right. (laughs) Right. Yes. And maintaining the fun in all of that Yeah, and and maintaining some sort of spontaneity so that it doesn't Mm -hmm. seem like drudgery. Yes. Right. So there's something, a new self-discipline that I'm working on myself, which is like you, I'm trying to get up earlier. Like Mm -hmm. today I got up at five, which if you would have told me five years ago that I was going to get up at five one day, I would have laughed in your face because I am a night owl. I don't like getting up. I like my sleep. Yeah. But I am motivated by the idea of getting done work a lot earlier in the day. Yes. And therefore having time to play or do whatever I feel like. And yep. so it's like creating that reward that you get to look forward to yes. <laughs> for the discipline that you're putting in right now. Yeah. So. And it's so important. And you just hit the nail on the head because you're giving yourself a reward for achieving that goal by right. doing that. So it's, yeah. it's key. Yes, for sure. Okay. So we talked a little bit about having a message to share. And I know one of the things that you uh, are an expert in is public speaking and you help people learn about public speaking and, and become better public speakers. So I think that a lot of our listeners probably have some goals of, of public speaking or mm-hmm. want to become better public speakers. So where, where would somebody start if they have no public speaking experience and they want to become a public speaker or they want to just get better or more confident speaking mm-hmm. in public? Can you share any tips or resources that might help them? Absolutely. It's all about connecting, Esther. Any type of public speaking all boils down to connecting. Mm -hmm. It's making that connection with your audience. You want to be relevant, you want to be memorable, and you want to help them achieve something that they're setting out to achieve. So you have to figure out how to connect. One way is through stories. It's so important that you share a little bit of yourself, no matter what type of speaking you're doing. So whether you're standing on stage or being interviewed on a podcast or leading a group at church or teaching a Bible study, whatever it might be, you need to be able to share a little bit about your story. And we all think, oh, I have nothing anybody would want to hear about, but that's so not true because people sitting in the audience can relate to whatever it is that you're sharing. If you have overcome some challenge or gotten through some struggle or had a hard time and learned how to do better with it, people need to hear that. They Mm -hmm. need to know that. It's so easy to get started with public speaking because these days everyone has a phone. You can put it on a tripod and videotape yourself Mm -hmm. so you can practice until the cows come home and then watch it back. We are our own worst critics. Yes. You will see what needs to be tweaked. (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, you can hire somebody, but start with videotaping yourself. It's so, so simple. And you'll, you'll learn so much just by watching. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just add to that. It's just it's just doing it. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> I was so shy and scared to death to speak in public when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And just over the years, having just been forced to in some situations, but then mm-hmm. also choosing to be in leadership roles where obviously if you're in a leadership role, you're speaking to a group of people, whether it's mm-hmm. five people or you know, 2,500. And the more I've done it, the more comfortable I've become. Yep. So, yes. So the important thing is to remember God gives us experiences right. and gives us skills and gives us expertise in order to share those things with other people, to help those other people. And you cannot do that from your couch. Right. You just can't. You have to bring those things to other people. Mm-hmm. So on stage or on Facebook Live or in a video or whatever type of speaking you're doing, you have right. those experiences for a reason. So you need to share them. Yeah. And if you're nervous, you just need to change your mindset. Your body responds the same way to anxiety as it does to excitement. So you Mm -hmm. just need to keep telling yourself, I am so excited. I am so excited to bring this message to these people who are here to listen. Because, you know, you get the sweaty palms, you get the stomach ache, you get the racing heartbeat. But it's the same whether you're nervous or excited. So just convince yourself that you're excited. That is a great hack, (laughs) a great (laughs) public speaking hack. (laughs) Well, you'll never, ever relieve the anxiety. So you just need to channel it into something else. Yes. And I've heard, you know, people that, that public speak for a living, they, Mm -hmm. they say that, that, that nervous feeling never goes away. Like they still get that queasiness right before they get on stage and they do you know, just it's a natural it. response. <laughs> I mean, you get less and less nervous, yeah. but you know, I think that just is, it comes from experience. Experience with anything makes you more confident in what you're doing, but right. the nerves are good because they propel you to do your best. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So most of us are multi-passionate here yeah. um, at this, you know, stage in our life and in mm-hmm. Most of our listeners are multi-passionate women. So can you tell us a little bit about your passions and what, hmm. what I mean, I can tell public speaking gets you excited because <laughs> I, I love watching you. You guys who are listening can't see Carrie, but it's fun to watch her as she speaks about that. But any other passions that you have that you love to, you know, do whether it's hobbies or other mm-hmm. things that you do for your business or life? I'm known for quite a few things. <laughs> bacon is one. I love bacon. I, I'm, I'm known for my love of coffee. I'm known for my love of country music. I'm also known for my love of Northern Michigan. Mm. My husband and I and our kids all do a whole lot of hiking and snowshoeing. And I am so passionate about that because it gets me away from what I do every day. It right. gets me unplugged. It gets me away from the noise. It gets me away from the sound and the overstimulation of our day-to-day activities and I can breathe, just breathe yeah, and hear myself breathe. Mm. And so that's something I absolutely love to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's an amazing point because we often are so inundated with, with messages from, Mm -hmm. from technology, from, you know, and a lot of it's good stuff, but having that chance to find something that you can do that gives you that white space and that brain space. (laughs) Yeah. It's the same reason why people tend to hear from God the most often in the shower, <laughs> mm-hmm. because it's the quietest 15 minutes of your day. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and that's partly why I love getting out there in yes. the snow or up in the hills or wherever it is, just to be quiet. And, and sometimes just to bounce ideas off of Ryan, you know, mm-hmm. we get so few instances in this house where it's just the two of us and it's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and so we literally have to leave in order yeah. to make that happen. And I just cherish that time. It's so important. Yeah. Such a good habit and such a good routine to be in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So you mentioned hearing from God. So I'd love to hear for you, how your faith as a Christian impacts how you run your business, how you lead, and how you kind of live your life. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a Christian business per se. And I think most of us who are Christians fall into that category. I'm not a Christian coach. I'm not a Christian life coach. 
nothing like that. But Christianity and my faith is a huge part of who I am, and it is how I run my business. The, the biblical foundation that runs my life also runs my business. Mm-hmm. I try to be honest in what I do. I try to be trustworthy. I try to teach people that they have experiences for a reason to help someone else. Those are all biblical foundations. I'm not necessarily quoting scripture at the people I'm working with, but mm-hmm. I tend to lead with my faith. Uh, it impacts every aspect of my life. When we dealt with our son in the hospital and he was so sick, all we did was pray. You know, mm. it was, it, our faith was everything in that time. Right. So, so faith is in every aspect of what I do. Right. And I think that's such a good point that you don't have to have a Christian business <laughs> right. to, to be an effective leader or to be an effective person in ministry. I mean, Right. If you're working in a church, you know, obviously your church is going to be, that's what it's going to be all about. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, your life, you can impact people by simply being an example and by treating people, like you said, with respect and kindness and yeah. all of the biblical principles. So for sure, for awesome. sure. And I work with people from all different backgrounds and all different faiths. And I don't want to ever make them feel like they have to be a certain way in order to work with me. Right. I, I don't want anyone to ever feel that way. I want them to feel like I respect and admire and love them regardless of their background. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I don't think I prepared you for this one. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sometimes I send a few questions to our guests before the, before the interview, but I, I added this one, but I would love to know how you define leadership. Hmm. I think leadership is when you work with other people to the point of their success because then that makes you successful. I mm-hmm. think if you can help other people become successful, then you are successful. That's an amazing definition. I love that. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, Very good. Cool. Okay, I good. Love, no, no, it's not a right or wrong. And that's what's so fun about this. That's what's fun about asking this question because everybody's different perspective just brings another facet to leadership, mm-hmm. right? And I think there's so much to it that every different person's perspective can can create a, you know, a unique way of looking at it. So. Yes, and we all lead in so many different ways. But when I'm working with a client... I just want them to succeed. I want them to shine on stage and achieve their goals and connect with that audience. And when they do, my job has been done. Right, right. And really, that's it's it's the example that Jesus set in that he was a servant. And really, when you're when you're working for someone else's success, you're serving them, and you're offering from yourself something that's going to benefit them. And I'm sure that's just a great way of doing it. Yeah. Serve your audience, serve whomever you're working with. Yeah. No divas allowed. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So Carrie, I believe leaders are learners and you've mm-hmm. mentioned several times, you know, your avid love of learning. So can you mm-hmm. tell us, first of all, the first question is, uh, what's your favorite method of learning new things? My favorite is probably reading because it's something that I can just do in quiet and set it aside when I'm interrupted 14 times, <laughs> which is inevitable in this household. So reading yeah. is probably my favorite, Okay. followed by listening. So if it's a podcast or a video or something like that, I can have it on in the background. So those would be my two, okay. I think, most often. I, I, oh. I love attending workshops. I love attending conferences, but obviously those things happen less than reading. Yeah. Right. You're not going to go to a conference every day. So right. I wish I could, but I can't. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what have you been reading or listening to lately that's been encouraging you or helping you to grow in some way? Mm-hmm. My favorite, and I know you like it too, is Carrie Newhoff's Leadership Podcast. Yes. I absolutely love that one because it affects so many different areas of life. It's not just business, but it is business. It's yeah. not just faith but it is faith. It's not just marriage, but it is marriage. It's Mm -hmm. all of those things. And I like that because if I only listen to business, I start second guessing myself all the time. You know, you get so much different information from different people and it's all good, but it also conflicts. Yeah. And it's the same with marriage or any one particular topic. So I like Mm -hmm. his because it's so well-rounded and makes me think 
it's not just telling me what to think. I am thinking. Yes. Yes. That is absolutely one of my favorite podcasts. So if you are listening to this podcast, I can guarantee you would probably enjoy Carrie's podcast. Yeah. It's all about leadership and and personal growth and development. And, um, but it has that, that faith perspective too. So yeah. Love him. Yes. Okay. So Carrie, as we get ready to wrap up, is there anything that we did not cover that you would like to share or just any closing thoughts that you might have that you want to share with our listeners? Yeah. I think what I hear the most from people is how hard they are on themselves, whether it's in parenting or leadership or in their marriage or in their business. They're just so hard on themselves. Everything doesn't go according to plan and it isn't perfect. And we want it to be so, <laughs> so badly. <laughs> yes. But we can't internalize that and think that that determines our value or our worth just because things don't go well. Doesn't mean that you aren't doing the right thing or that you aren't making a difference somewhere. It's so mm. important that you not be hard on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that is knowing that your identity and who you are is not connected to what you do. <laughs> For sure. Right. And being able to just rest in how God has made you. And yes. And then whatever you do is hopefully it's going to honor him and and help some people and help yourself. But yes. But that if you have failure, that doesn't mean you've completely lost everything. So that's right. And keep the blinders on. Focus just on him and what he wants for you and not compare yourself to all those things that you see going on around you. Right. Right. Yes. All right. So Carrie, tell us where uh, our audience can connect with you if they want to know more about all the stuff we talked about, communication, conflict resolution, public speaking, where can they find you? And if you have something you want to offer to our audience, you can share that as well. Mm -hmm. Our business is called He Says, She Says. It's online at www.ryancarriesharp.com. We're also on all the social media channels under He Says, She Says. But the absolute best place to connect with me and interact is in our Facebook group called Communicate to Connect by He Says, She Says. I'm in there every day. There's lots of other people in there sharing their experiences with communication and public speaking. And everybody is so encouraging and and helps each other. And I just love it there. So I would love for your listeners to join there. And there's a freebie that uh, I know you'll have in the show notes. People can and get an audio from me, the easiest ways to connect with your audience, three tried and true ways. It's a simple 10 minute audio to listen to really helps people resonate with their audience and relate to them. Awesome. I love that, Carrie. And I will say I am in Carrie's group. I love it. She does have all kinds of fun challenges and things <laughs> to really help you grow in your communication skills. So we will be sure to put all these links in the show notes. So be sure to go over and check those out after you get done listening. So thank you, Carrie, so much for your time and for being on this podcast with me. Thanks, Esther. Thanks for joining us on the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. Do you want to become a more confident leader? Then make sure to grab the Confident Leader Manifesto. This is a resource that Holly and I developed just for you. And I share all about it in episode six, Leading with Confidence. You can get the manifesto for yourself at estherlittlefield.com slash confident. And that's confident with a T. Now don't forget, your leadership matters. And it's time for you to embrace your gifts and lead with confidence.